So uh, today I'd like to say a few words about um, a religion that goes in, in English uh, using our ism words. Uh, it's known as Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism. Now, um, Zoroastrianism has been known by other names uh, as well. It has its own names for itself. Um, and um, one name for this religious tradition, uh, its own name for itself, one of its own names for itself is the uh, Daina Mazdiyazni, or the good religion of the worship, worshipers of Mazda. And um, one scholar uh, following a, a tradition, uh, an old tradition, simply in English refers to Zoroastrianism by a self-designation of this tradition. It refers to itself as the good religion. Now, it is entirely possible that many uh, of my listeners have never heard of Zoroastrianism, have never heard of the, of the good religion of, of Mazda. Um, and so today my job is to try to communicate, to convey uh, at least an image or two, an idea or two that we can take with us as we go on our way with our, in our first acquaintance perhaps with this religious tradition. Now, when, uh, when I was a grad student at, at, at Harvard back in the day, uh, a great figure there, uh, one of the uh, comparative religionists of that period uh, and director for the, of the Center for the Study of World Religions, Wilfred Cantwell Smith, in his uh, introductory lectures to this religious tradition, often re did refer to its founder, or one of its great figures, Zoroaster, as perhaps the most significant figure in human religious history. And uh, that's a paraphrase, and we could find the direct quote, I'm sure. Uh, that's, that's big praise. That's great praise. That's, uh, that's a, a large claim. And, uh, Certainly one can argue with that claim, but there is no arguing with the uh, pervasive influence of, uh, of the founder or one of the great figures, the great prophet of this religious tradition, whose name is Zoroaster. Now, Zoroaster is the Greek version of his name, a, Eng a Greek in English version of his name, and his name in Persian was uh, Zarathustra, Zarathustra. And some of us are familiar with that uh, from perhaps our only familiarity with Zarathustra is in the title of a book by Nietzsche uh, in English, Thus Spake Zarathustra. So who was Zarathustra? How is it that he's such an influential human being? Uh, his dates are variable. It's hard to actually find a, a scholarly agreement on his dates, and I tend to agree, agree with, he, with the fact that he probably lived around the year 600 BCE. So perhaps about 2,600 years ago, but he gets dated back even older than that, and, he gets, and his dates get pushed up a little bit closer as well. Um, his life was eventful, uh, and what is most significant about his teaching was that um, in the uh, religious context of his day uh, and among his own people, because the religion, the good religion, did exist before his time, he was a reforming prophet in that religion. In fact, in many ways, the whole idea of a prophet, of someone who speaks the words of God or a God, uh, not his or her own words, but the words of a God and speaks them, perhaps in judgment, but offer also in grace uh, to uh, people in a religious community. This, this idea of the prophet as a, vo as a kind of spokesperson for God, in many ways, uh, this begins with Zarathustra. And that whole image of prophethood that we see coming down then through the biblical prophets and then through, uh, through Jesus uh, as in his, in his role as a prophet, priest, and king in, from a Christian perspective. And then in Islam where, where Adam and, uh, and Moses and Jesus uh, also are prophets along with the prophet Muhammad. And then later in the Baha'i faith uh, where we have the great prof prophetic uh, uh, career of Baha'u'llah. And then, of course, in the Mormon tradition, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we also have uh, the role of the prophet. So he was, if you will, the first great prophet. And what made, what was with the center of his prophetic message? Moral goodness, choosing the good, 
choosing to act in a righteous and just manner as opposed to acting in an unjust manner. Now, in the religious context of his day, hard to recover today, but what emerges from attempts to reconstruct that period is that religiosity in those days was perhaps overly concerned with the correct performance of ceremonies, ritualism, ritual purity, the notion of purity was more connected with certain kinds of behavior, uh, with whom one associated with, with the kinds of food that one ate, with bathing practices. And for Zarathustra, this was all uh, secondary to the most fundamental uh, characteristic of the spiritual life, which was moral goodness, not ritual purity, but moral goodness. And using the standard of moral goodness um, uh, as, uh, as his standard, uh, he actually called uh, the religious people of his day to account, and he called them to act righteously instead of acting ritualistically. This created a good deal, a great many enemies for him, but it also brought a, a, an element of moral realism and moral urgency into, into, the, into the good religion, which was communicated to Judaism because the Jewish people during the time of captivity, um, after the destruction of the first temple, uh, they found refuge uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in Persia. And um, one of the great Persian emperors is even called Messiah in the, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, book of Isaiah. Um, so, so how to make this, uh, this uh, uh, Zoroaster's influence more concrete is to ask, and I sometimes will ask in in, in, in the settings where I teach, where these ideas are common, is there anyone here who believes in or uh, believes in the, in the Messiah or thinks that the Messiah is coming? Is there anyone here who thinks that there will be a kind of end times day of judgment, that there will be a resurrection of the dead and that there will be, that the dead will stand before uh, the judge and be judged for their deeds and that the righteous will inherit uh, heaven eternal life and the unrighteous will inherit hell or, or damnation. And of course, these ideas, and I'll read a summary of them from a leading Zoroastrian scholar. Of course, these ideas are familiar to my audience, to many in my audience. And uh, um, a, a Zoroastrian scholar, uh, Mary Boyce, uh, wrote, Zoroaster was the first to teach the doctrines of an individual judgment, a, a kind of when you die, you, you're immediately judged by God in some tribunal for the quali moral quality of your life. And then the, the, the diverging destinies of heaven and hell, the resurrection of the body, the general last judgment, and life everlasting for the reunited soul and body. These are ideas, many of which are familiar to us from, uh, from in Judaism, especially after the earlier biblical periods. They're certainly central to Christianity. They're definitely central to Islam. Uh, and they're not, they don't shape, however, the religions of India. They're not central to Buddhism or Hinduism or Jainism. And, of course, the moral realism of the Buddha, his turn towards ethics and his interpretation of the doctrine of karma, um, this can be seen, perhaps, some scholars think, as in the influence of Zoroaster. So if any of these ideas impact you, whether you believe in them or not, the idea of heaven and hell, the resurrection of the body, the idea of a, the kind of an end times uh, cataclysmic war between the angels of light and the angels of darkness, if any of these ideas have shaped you, without your realizing it, you're a good Zoroastrian. And that is what Professor Cantwell Smith meant by the, the out, uh, outsized influence of Zoroaster in our lives. Now, Zoroastrianism was once the religion of Iran. Uh, today, Iran is, of of course, uh, Islamic, and there are a very small number of Zarathustis or Zoroastrians still in Iran. Uh, Zoroastrians found refuge in India, uh, and they are known there as Parsis, and one does, one, you can encounter uh, Par uh, Parsis uh, wherever there is a, a significant community of, of Indians in the Indian diaspora, people of Indian background. Um, and Zoroastrianism was actually the state religion of three 
Iranian or Persian empires. Its influence once was so vast that it actually extended perhaps as far uh, into the east as, uh, as, as India, for sure, so if perhaps not even into China. And its influence was felt uh, as far uh, uh, to the west as France, where it influenced the medieval movements like, like the Qatars and others. And yet today, Zoroaster, Zoroastrianism, uh, the good religion, uh, has a, a small number of followers. But the influence of Zoroaster, as I tried to suggest in these few minutes together, it has been uh, pervasive wherever these ideas, these familiar ideas of the so-called Abrahamic religions are encountered. There we meet Zoroaster in disguise, perhaps, if you will.